to the um, Tuesday, November 3rd school board meeting. If you could all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Um, adjustments to the agenda, Alan. Do we have any? Uh, I have a couple of things to ask out to you. One is the population figures because we were so quick with this meeting, they just got done. So these are current population figures. And I do want to speak about the H1N1, and I'm going to send you the statistics that we have from that night. I'm going to keep one for myself. Did you get enough going that way? No. Need one more. One more. There you go. There you go. Thank you. Okay. So those are the two additions that I do have. Okay. H1N1 is on there. So yes, just, it is. Okay. Um, approval of the school board minutes from the regular business meeting on Tuesday, October 13th. Um, can I have a motion to do that? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions, comments, corrections? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Six zero, thank you. Comments by our student representatives. I don't see middle any middle school, school student representatives aren't going to be here tonight. Okay. So let me know that, that they couldn't be here tonight. Okay, Matt, you are on for the high school. All right. Um, well, first quarter ended Friday, so I know the high school students are pretty uh, happy about that. They're breathing a lot easier. Uh, this Saturday, football is playing well in the playoffs, and we have a dance that night. I know Mr. Shed's looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> other than that, there's not a whole lot going. I shared with some students about the first reading of substance abuse tonight, and they were all pretty pleased with that, that that was going along pretty well. But other than that, there's not much to report. Mm -hmm. um, any questions from Matt? Um, Comments from the public on non-agenda items. I don't see any members of the public, so I'm going to, going to assume that we can move on from that. Um, recognition, Middle School President's Council on Physical Fitness. Alan? Uh, that was one you, uh, we have a letter in our packet for that. Bear with me for just a minute. Uh, this one is from one of the teachers, and it's about Andy Strout and Sarah Kinsella. And it says, congratulations to you and your students for recently being named state champions by the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. In this era of renewed concerns about fitness and health, this award is truly special recognition of your hard work and dedication as professionals. The award speaks to your ability to, uh, to motivate your students to perform to the best of their ability and to take pride in all facets of learning. A physically fit child is on his or her way to being a young person with overall wellness. Good job uh, to all, and that's to Andy Stroud and Sarah Kinsella and their program at the middle school. Thank you, Alan. Um, I have a question. Yes. What, what does it mean to be state champions? What was, what was uh, achieved? What was tested? I'm not, I, I have to be honest with you, I'm not sure. If, when Steve comes in, perhaps he can give a little more information. I do know, I, I, I do know it's connected to uh, Andy and Sarah. Uh, your kids are at the middle school, I think. If they do an assessment with every child, they have a setup on the computer, and they take a look at all of the different pieces to the puzzle. So I'm assuming that's part of it, but I'm sure probably Steve can give a little more information. Okay, um, high school government class candidates night. Are you doing that, Alan? Or am I? I wanted to extend um, a thank you to Ted Jordan um, at the high school as well as the students in his government class that worked um, hard to conduct and to manage the candidates' night that we had several weeks ago for the school board and town council elections. I know they took some time to prepare that. I think it was a great learning opportunity for all the students, and we wanted to thank them for doing that. And I would say very positively done. I was at the school board one. I didn't make it to town council. You went to the town council one, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. yep. Any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. Okay, the World Affairs International Vis Visitor Leadership Presentation. Um, I wanted to, um, the board would like to recognize um, Gretchen McNulty and the, at the high school and the World Affairs Council for two programs that they've done. Um, they once again hosted Eight to ten women, I believe, um, that were sponsored by the State Department. It's a program where they bring 
women who um, are potential leaders in primarily the Middle Eastern countries to the United States. And they were, um, had a panel discussion and presentation over at the high school. And um, I want, I, it was an interesting learning experience. I don't know, Matt, if you happen to attend and if you, not to put you on the spot, but did you have any comments? Um, yeah, I've seen it the last two years. It's definitely a pretty cool thing to see. Um, students get to interact with the visitors about international relations and how their jobs in their country are similar to ones in ours and also how um, perceptions are different in the two. So it's definitely rewarding. Thank you. Um, and also recently or a week or so ago they put on a presentation um, on a Sunday evening. It was a group called Link that um, ha, ha, it's a Nine Lives campaign and it Real, it show, shared information about the um, situation in North Korea, which is rather dire for the citizens there. And I think it, it took some time for them to plan. I think it's really important that our, group, our students are doing this, and um, it's a great learning experience, as Matt had said, and brings, it helps them become more global citizens. So I don't know if anyone else wants to comment. Okay, parent-student-teacher conference participation. Yep. We, have, we have just gone through the process of parent-student conferences uh, within the last few weeks and I did would ask uh, Jeff and Tom if you could just speak briefly about how they went at your buildings as far as setup and and uh, how uh, many people you had I don't ask for percentages or anything like that but just how it went at the I'm not sure exactly how many parents were there but I can tell you that um, we had more teachers who had uh, full schedules of conferences from the first moment that we opened conferences until the end uh, with just some brief breaks that we ever had which is a testament to the interest of uh, parents to find out and stay involved in their kids academic lives which I think is really great um, we have talked about and it's been a conversation for a couple of years about Although I think that the parent-teacher conference sign-up process works as efficiently as it could, given what we have to do, um, there's some thought about possibly doing something similar to what community services did and do a lottery system, where parents are assigned a particular slot of time to come in and sign up for conferences. That's not a done deal, but it's, it's, a, it's a discussion. But I do think it, in terms of the conferences themselves, I think it's, a, it's just a fabulous opportunity for parents and teachers to interact with one another and build some relationships that are really important. I think it went well. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening. Uh, historically, parent conference time has been a very important time of the year for all the uh, the Pond Cove community. The teachers really um, arrange their schedule. We like it a little later in the fall so the teachers know their kids and we've done some assessments by then. And I want to thank the teachers for the prep time they put into it. Alan's question about how many, it, it approaches 100% every year. There's an expectation that people come. Um, almost 100% people come during that uh, window and if they don't they make it up later. Um, it's, it's just a very nice rhythm of the year. This is when we also are able to keep kids going or making good progress and it's a good uh, alert for us for, for kids who might be struggling. So I want to thank the teachers and the parents for their involvement. Thank you, Tom. Do you have and at the middle school, uh, since uh, uh, Steve isn't here, I will just comment that they have also had their parent conferences. The guidance counselors are very active in that process and uh, getting things set up and going and also each team uh, is in contact with parents so parents do get a chance to get in. And like uh, Pond Cove in particular, they do it over a period of days so that they can be sure that as many parents can get in as possible. Thank you, Alan. Um, community volunteer support and book fairs and fall festival. And I think we put this on here mainly because I personally, as superintendent, am amazed at the amount of community support and volunteerism that goes on in this town. Uh, down in, under communications, I'm going to talk about finances. And I, when I look at that, I look at it from the perspective of this community has parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, who really step in and help support uh, so many processes in this, in this community. Uh, you know, we can look at the very formal presentation by SEAF, but we also look at individual parents. And when I get down to H1N1, 
Uh, it's going to give me a great deal of pleasure to talk about the enormous number of people who come in and work with us. But I think it's important that we every now and then just stop and realize the work that the community, the community does and volunteers do. And we might mention too here the book fairs and the fall festivals. But there are just so many different ways that everyone in this community is involved. And this community should be very, very proud of that. Thank you, Alan. Any other comments, questions? I'll just say that in particular, um, I thought that the fall festival, um, moving it to the Turkey Hill Farm, was an act of inspiration. And I love the fact that we were able to involve our farm and open space and land trust community um, with, with the school community. And um, I think that's what, make Cape, that's what makes Cape Elizabeth so great. Definitely. Thank you. Um, Gary Lenoy and the Acton Conference. Gary, if you would mind coming up and uh, spending a few minutes. Gary was very active in putting the Acton Conference together. Uh, had over a thousand people, I think he said there. And uh, it was an amazing opportunity for people all across the state. Gary. Yes, I somehow get roped into chairing that conference. I've done it for four years in a row, but we bring together main educators from all over the state. We, we feature some national speakers. We try to bring in the, you know, the, the real big thinkers dealing with technology and education, uh, and expose our, the main educators to them. And that's that's where we have we had about 20 staff members from Cape Elizabeth uh, at the Acton Conference this year, and they all came back really excited and enthused about all the kinds of things that they saw there. And if I could just add one thing to that, we just met this afternoon because we are also just starting the process of building our technology plan for the state, which was for, for 2010 to 2013. And I can remember back when we were doing it the first time I was here, and then before that when I did it in the other town I was superintendent in. And it is amazing, the changes of our views around technology and the role it plays in education, and uh, how that growth has been shown very clearly, and it will be an interesting process to put this newest report together. And so while we have him as a captive audience, can we go to uh, communication? Except I want to add something about sure. the Acton Conference. First, to um, explain acronyms, let me see if I get this right. Actum is Annual Conference for Technology Educators of Maine? Yes, it's, uh, it stands for the Association of Association. Computer Technology Educators Sorry. of Maine. It's a mouthful. So, but. <laughs> I gave it a shot. Four Thank you. Isn't bad. And I was. Uh, I also. Gary is much too humble. We are blessed to have him here. Um, that conference is a big deal. It's, there are vendors there. There are educators from all over the state. And um, Gary is very involved in planning that. And I actually had the opportunity to attend some of the sessions, and it was great. So thank you um, for having that contact and so, so well representing Cape Elizabeth. We appreciate it. Now you can move to technology later, Alan. Would you, would you like to talk about our technology integrators for a few minutes and what they're doing? Sure. Um, I was, Alan asked me just to spend a few minutes talking about tech integrators. I'm hoping that we can spend a little bit longer time in a, maybe in a school board workshop or something like that later in the year and really take a look at some of the things that are happening. Uh, can't do it justice in, in a few br brief moments here. Some people may be wondering what these people are. What are tech integrators? Uh, the primary job function is to work with teachers to help them integrate technology into the classroom. Uh, we'll look, these people are, are educators. Um, they have a combination of good academic and technical knowledge. And they also have great people skills. Um, there are on the line professional development. In businesses and industries, when some kind of new initiative happens, the training usually happens right in the business, right in the working hours. The schools don't tend to do as much of that. Well, these people help with that. There are key PD people right there in the building. They can go into classes. Uh, I know you, you talked about Ted Jordan's government class. Our, our high school tech integrator helped develop a, an exit poll so people that are at the, at the uh, elections today have the chance to fill in the, uh, an exit poll using a tool called Google Docs and a form. And the kids are going to go back and actually take a look and do some analysis of, of some of the things and look at some demographics from, from people and how they've responded. So things like that, using the technology, collecting the data, analyzing the data. Um, they're, they're the key people to uh, provide the technical support right during the workday when, when staff need it. They can help teachers. They're, they know they have enough understanding about the curriculum and the technology to help them work together. They can he help the, us 
maximize our, our investment in technology so that we can use it to the best of our ability. The, the kids are what I, I've used the term you know, digital natives and digital immigrants. The kids, technology is second nature to them, but some of our staff it's not quite as second nature. And we need that extra, little extra support. And some of these people are, are providing that. We have one at each building level, uh, and it's, it's been great to have that, that support level. I've always said during budget times that we need two kinds of support for technology. We need the technical level support, we need the professional level. The integrators are that professional level support that's been missing for many years. We looked at our technology plan back in, I pulled out one of the first ones that I worked on back in 1994. And we talked about having some of those types of people way back then in 1994. And finally we have them in, what is this, 2009. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Gary, are, are you, um, do you have some sort of system to track which teachers are requesting the assistance of the technology integrators and for what reasons? So we have a way of seeing specific information as to the impact of their work. We will have some of that information. Yes, we do. Okay, great. We're doing it right through our help desk system. Great. So. Anybody else? Question or comment? Mary? I wanted to ask that same question and about um, logging hours that the, um, they're able to spend in classrooms with teachers to improve learning. That would be helpful. We're not getting as finite as the hours, but we are getting the, the types, types of services that they're providing. Okay. Throughout the school. And, and we're getting teacher, teacher name information because what I'm actually most curious about is um, are we actually reaching more teachers with technology or is it the same teachers that are taking technology even further and further in their classroom? Because well, one I'm, of the ideas of the technology integrators is that we were going to help those immigrants become natives with the help of, of these positions. So if, if there's a way to c track that information and present it at a later time, I think that would be very useful. We have a weekly, weekly meeting with the tech integrators, or I do, and some of the people I hear them working with are, are not the people that we've helped a lot in the past. So we are reaching more people. Okay. And do you have a sense of some of the teachers who maybe are not fully utilizing technology and, and trying to um, uh, and we're trying to work with them. penetrate those classrooms mm -hmm. as yeah. well? Okay. Anybody else? Other questions? Thank you very much, Gary. Appreciate it. Thanks, Gary. Um, workshop update. I think we just, the school board would just like to let the public know and invite them to attend our workshops that we have shifted our focus a little bit on the workshops and are, have designated specific curriculum areas for presentation and discussion at each of those. Um, and we started off with science last week. Um, the school board is sort of, as this is a first time around for us, we're um, working through the process to make it um, more useful, provide more useful information for our administrators, our staff, the school board, and for members of the public. Um, our next workshop is scheduled for um, Tuesday the 10th, which is next week, and we'll be looking at ELA. And there is a series of other curriculum items that um, areas that will be discussed as the months go on. Our workshops as are held in the high school library because of scheduling conflicts in here. They're not televised on a regular basis, however, I think because We're of the importance of the information that's going to be um, discussed and communicated in these meetings that we're going to attempt to yep. get those either streamed on the web or something available. We're, we're looking into it now so that we'll have some to, someone to film next week. Thank you, Alan. Um, Just for those people who don't know, ELA is English Language Arts. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't so well, do so well in the other acronyms, though. <laughs> um, anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, um, and we actually, I do want to extend a thank you to our administrators. We're act asking them to do mm -hmm. work in a, a slightly different way, which hopefully will be in the long run useful to them, but I think the board would like to express their appreciation for the work that they're doing. Um, guidance work. Alan. Yes, uh, one of the groups that I have been working with is guidance to put together a comprehensive guidance plan, which we'll be re reporting to the board on in uh, early spring. But I did want to spend a few minutes talking about it and what some of the work they've been doing. And I particularly would like to focus on the high school because uh, the new head of guidance at the high school, uh, Belinda, has really re-looked at how 
we present information, how we get to parents, how we make sure they have uh, constructive information as they work their way through the school system. So in September, she started out with the ninth grade parents and had a meeting with them. Uh, there were, uh, Jeff and Troy were there along with the guidance counselors, along with people from the Achievement Center, uh, and the school nurse, the, the social worker, uh, health educator, all of those people were there to talk about as you bring your child to ninth grade. These are some of the things that you'll be experiencing at that point in time. I, I happened to be there too. I had hoped to be at all four of those meetings. I haven't made all of them. But what I found very clearly was the opening of communication, which I think has been badly needed and extremely important, has really come through in this. The next time uh, they met with parents, I have the list here, they met with the sophomore parents in October and did basically the same thing, but talked about programs, talked about what as a sophomore can you begin to expect for your children as they work their way through high school. And again, I think the information they received was extremely helpful. They then moved to the junior class, and that was on October 20th. And any of you who had a junior in high school, you know that becomes a really uh, demanding year because they are beginning to look at colleges or other, other educational programs. Uh, the demands from colleges, the, what I remember very clearly as a parent was going home every day and our mailbox was stuffed full of college information. And so it becomes a uh, very important to understand that, to understand the tests they have to take, to understand the application process, to understand what they need to have, what I say, under their belts in order to be ready to go on to college. So that is an extremely important year and again, they did an excellent job trying to cover all of the pieces to that puzzle. And then of course, you have the seniors. And the senior year is an interesting year in many ways. You have seniors who are beginning to think it's about time I get out of high school and go on to college or wherever I'm going to go. But there's a lot of things that they have to do in the process. Uh, some of you are senior parents sitting here. So I know what, you're, what you have been working with as far as getting applications ready, writing essays, making sure you have all your documentation in place, making sure it's done on time, making sure you have all the support people available. And so again, I, where I am watching this, and they have kept me well informed with this notebook, is that I see a very clear focus for freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, which I, I personally value. I wish I had seen that for my own children when they were going through high school. And I'm hoping for the parents who are sitting here who have high school seniors now, or uh, juniors, or sophomores, or freshmen, are finding this informational opportunity uh, a real plus as they work their way through Cape Elizabeth High School. And I will add to that is the middle school counselors have been working very hard in changing the whole look of middle school counseling as well. And so that is another place and they are also looking at how do we sequence all of the teaching that goes on with guidance counselors so that students are ready at each stage along the way. Thank you. Um, have any comments or questions? Um, I'd just like to um, thank all of those who were responsible for putting that evening together together. It was, um, I have a sophomore and I found the evening incredibly helpful, not just in um, the, you know, what to expect academically, but I found probably the most useful piece was the psychosocial piece that students are going through. And I think parents forget um, the pressures that kids are under. And I thought the school did a very nice job um, bringing parents up to speed on that as well as the other pieces. So I thought they integrated all of that information beautifully. And um, I just am very grateful um, that the school is doing that. It's very helpful. Anyone else? I would just like to reiterate that and also say that um, I have actually attended two of them. And I have to say that particularly for the sophomore one I attended, I observed a shift in emphasis from stressing parents out about college as parents of sophomores to more of an emphasis on sort of the whole child. And I think that um, it was a great reflection on and work on the part of the guidance department. I thought that was very helpful and, and nice to see. Student testing evaluations and data, Alan. We, we put this on for only a brief comment or two about it is 
Frequently, as school starts, we begin to hear from people saying, why are you testing our children so much? What is the purpose behind it? And I will be the first to say to you, we do use a lot of testing. Some of the testing we use is because of federal and state law that we have to assess where students are. But the other piece of the puzzle is, is one, something that we have not used well over a period of time is data. And looking at data and seeing for each child who we work with, what are we seeing as far as growth and understanding and knowledge development. And so that has become extremely important. Uh, MEAs, main educational assessments, we've all known of for several years. We know that this year it changed from the MEAs to the kneecaps. They also changed the timing of it, so it's in the fall, uh, which ha caused us to take a close look at the uh, NWEAs, which is another series of tests, which we try to do uh, from grades three until grade 10, uh, at least three times a year. We have had to move back on that a little bit. <coughs> we also use several testings at the uh, Pont Hove for first kindergarten and first graders. Uh, we also look at the SATs and PSATs and the results there. But I, I, I think for most people to understand that in 175 days of school, uh, an awful lot has to be done. And I'll talk a little more about that when I talk about each one in one. But I think it's important to understand that we also take on the responsibility of ensuring that learning is occurring. And so this is an opportunity in order to do that. Any questions or <coughs> comments? Alan, I have a question. How often are the knee, what, what grades are the kneecaps given? Knee, kneecaps are from grade three to grade eight. Every year? <clears throat> Starting this year. Every, every fall. Right, <coughs> and, and that is what is addressing the No Child Left Behind requirements. Okay. And that's how many days of testing? It was fairly long. Probably, Tom, you know better. It, it was longer than the MEA for some reason. We were usually able to do the MEA in three or four days. It took six days because of the requirements of the tests in Pont Cove. And it took even longer in the middle school because they have more content than we do. So it, it's more of a burden than ever before. And we're talking about the whole child. The, the kids really feel it because it's not, I'll just get on my soapbox. It's not just taking the kneecap. It, it disrupts their day quite a bit. And a lot of them feel the pressure. I don't think a year has gone by of doing these tests that at least one test comes in with they're wet because kids have cried on them. If, from my own personal perspective, I would encourage DLT and, and administrators to um, consider keeping in place less the only two NWEA testings, given the fact that these kneecaps are so intensive. But from our household, I can tell you that it was actually much more stressful than the MEA. Um, they were exhausted and they were really tired of tests by the time the kneecap was done. So, um, and they really enjoy your teachers a lot more. <laughs> and, and I think they're getting a lot more from it. So while I support the need for data, I do, and I do think that we also need to consider the price that we're paying, not just with our time and teaching time, but also with our kids. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I just want to add to that. I agree that there's a balance, but I also think when this is a perfect example when we say during various times during the year about how legislated and regulated public education is, many of these, um, this is an example of some of the requirements that we need to do, the laws that we need to comply with. So sometimes that's sort of driving our decision making. So. Thank you, Alan. Now to a subject that is near and dear to your heart, <laughs> H1N1. I don't think I ever dreamt that I would become an expert mm -hmm. on vaccinations as, as I have this year. But on the other side of the coin, it has been an interesting growing experience. I see one of my volunteers sitting right up front here. Uh, we have, on Friday, we did our first round of vaccinations and nasal mist for the H1N1. Uh, we were the second school system in the state that's done it. Uh, Westbrook was ahead of us. Uh, several have already had to cancel because they do not have enough supplies in. But I was absolutely amazed, number one, when I looked at numbers. Uh, we were told to expect 
probably 50% if you were lucky. On Friday, we uh, gave a total of 1,257 uh, either the shot or the nasal mist. Uh, we were very, sh we did not have a lot of the injectables. Uh, up to two or three days before that, we only had 100. Uh, luckily, 300 came in at the last minute. Our nurses worked diligently to call parents, to explain the situation to them, to ensure that the students who should have the injectables, who are students who have uh, either diabetes or have some kind of, a, of uh, asthma or other type of lung situation, that we had enough of the injectables to go with them. Uh, that worked well. It took a lot of time, the nurses will tell you, but uh, the results were amazing. Uh, I did find out this morning from Cindy, we did do three more at the very end who came at the end, so we really did 1,260. Now, if you stop and figure that we have 1,709 kids in Cape Elizabeth, and we did uh, 1,260. Uh, I took this to Maine Medical Center this morning to my uh, weekly meeting. They were just uh, shocked at how well we did because they haven't had a chance to see other school districts and what is going on. But in order to do this, it has taken an enormous amount of work. And it is work that was extremely important. Uh, as you probably know, I have a flu group which is made up of our nurses, our administrators, Gary, uh, Janet, uh, Pauline, uh, and other people in the community, the doctor, Dr. Safer, we meet every single Friday at 7 o'clock in the morning in order to take a look at where are we, where are we going, what do we need to do to discuss the issues, et cetera, and to be prepared for this. Uh, I heard some people who said, why are you taking school time? Because students should be learning. My argument with it is this. I would not do this for a lot of vaccines, but we have a life and death situation. We see what's happening nationally, and I personally do not want to be a superintendent who is responsible for not having it done this way and something happening to one of our children. And schools are the best place to get them and make sure they get this. If you do it on a Saturday, if you do it in the evening, you won't get the same number of people there. So I feel very fortunate. I also understand from Cindy this morning that we have had many calls from parents who did not want to do it, but now have decided they would like to. And this, uh, this morning, I also found out from uh, Meredith Tipton, who heads of vaccination for Cumberland and York County, that we have enough. So in two weeks, we can do another one to provide it for those kids who are absent or whose parents have changed their minds. We are also looking at December 9th as the day for the second dose of H1N1 for those children who are 10 or under. And right now our count is at 413 of them that have to have that second dosage. And so we will do it that day. Both flu mist and shot? But we'll be, they've got these, uh, the second uh, regular shot. So now they need to have a second H1N1 if they are under the age of 10. If you got the flu mist, you need a second flu mist? No, you can have either mist or the inoculation, either way. Okay, I'm still not being clear. Okay. If, if a child got a flu mist, are they going to be, uh, do they need a second dose? Yes. Okay, thank yeah. you. If they're under 10, 10 or under. Yeah. They just changed it. It was under 10, now it is 10 or under. So that's where we get the 431. Uh, we have planned for a community vaccination on November 12th. That does not look as promising. It, uh, as of today, they told me they weren't sure they were going to have the uh, supplies in in order to do that. Obviously, their main focus is school-aged children, number one. Number two, every woman who is pregnant. Number three, caregivers of every child under six months, uh, six months old, and also for EMS workers. And so that's where the focus is coming from. And again, we are only the second system in the state that has done this. Uh, there are other systems who are going to be starting uh, next week to try to get most of theirs done as well. But in order to do this, again, I want to go back to the volunteer process that we have here in Cape Elizabeth. I spent both days, I was there before it opened, I stayed there all day long, I did leave half an hour early on Friday because I had to get to another appointment, but otherwise I was there every minute. And I cannot tell you what amazing support we had from everyone who was there. 
parent volunteers to nurses to doctors or for all of those people who came and helped us. We had eight people from SACO, from the VN, uh, VNA down there. Uh, we had a doctor who was retired and came in and gave shots as well. We had people who manned the tables and took care of the tables. We had people who took uh, their temperatures. We had people who oversaw them where they, so they stayed the 15 minutes and met the requirements there, etc. And I have a list here of 25 people who are with us all day long. I just finished uh, this afternoon writing notes to every single one of them to thank them for all of the work they did. But it is really important to understand that many systems across the state are envious of the fact that when we need our help, we get it. And people do come, and they are there, and uh, work with us very closely. And I truly, truly appreciate that. And uh, Dr. Savardov is one of those who has been with us very straight through both times, right? You were with us the first time, too. So it is, uh, it is very important that we do that. And I can't say enough about all of the support we get in this. So I thank everyone who's played a role in that. Thank you, Alan. Alan, have we actually had any cases in Cape Elizabeth? Yes. What I understand is we have one that I know of that has been identified. We have several who are out sick. Uh, right now, it is very difficult to get a true identification because there are so many. Uh, so I, the only, I only know of one out of middle school at this point in time. Uh, I did find out today, again, it's, it has been interesting to be a part of the Maine Medical Center group. I'm the only superintendent or school person that's on the group. But in listening to what they're telling us, they are still in fear within the next month of having a major outbreak. They're hoping by doing as many students as we're doing, it will slow that down. But they are already beginning to take a look at what they're going to do at Maine Medical Center, what they're going to do at Mercy, as numbers rise, as doctors get sick, as nurses get sick, and how you're going to do that. So we have uh, Cumberland County Emergency Preparedness working with us. Uh, we have people on all levels of hospital and medical work working with us to, to manage that. And so it's, uh, it's been an interesting process. And as I said to them today, I hope they'll write a book afterwards to talk about all the things we did right and all the things we had to learn, sometimes the hard way, in order to get to where we are. Well, I'll just, Alan, I just want to say thank you so much for your diligence with this. Uh, you have been on top of this from the very get-go. And um, our, the, the children of Cape Elizabeth have really benefited from that fact, um, especially since we were, have been so early in getting the vaccinations out. And I do believe that there are several communities south of us who have had a fairly substantial number of cases reported. So um, I, on a personal level, I'm very grateful, <laughs> and also as a school board uh, member. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thank you. I would echo that, at Rebecca's comments, and also say I think it would be fair to say that I could speak for the board and reiterate your thanks to all the volunteers oh. and to you, the group um, staff and volunteers who are participating in the flu group with you. So I, you got to come up I, with a better name than the flu group, though. <laughs> can I just add one thing to that, though, is to have these people every Friday morning downstairs at 7 o'clock in the morning meeting to take a look at what we're doing and to work our way through the process, I think it's just been amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, shows an enormous amount of dedication and hard work through the process. Okay. Um, any other comments or questions on that? Okay. Athletics. Okay. Um, hopefully this will be a little bit more uh, exciting and um, positive than the N1H1, but uh, we do have some big athletic events coming up and um, kind of winding down our fall athletics with uh, boys and girls cross country teams are competing in the state championship this Saturday uh, at Twin Brooks and uh, the first race will start at 12.30 and the boys race will start uh, about a half hour after that and uh, after you, everyone is able to attend and, and support the cross country team they'll be able to uh, come back to Cape Elizabeth and um, show their support for the football team who's participating in our quarterfinals against Wells this Saturday at 1 o'clock um, so that's exciting. Um, I'd like to also congratulate our cross country teams for their uh, outstanding individual and team performances. We had a first place finish for the girls and a fourth place finish for the boys in uh, Western Maine Class B. And I think the last time we had met, I hadn't had a chance to uh, congratulate our golf team as well because they had 
also qualified for the Class B state championships. Um, they finished uh, in fourth place and had some uh, outstanding individual performance in there as well. So um, kudos to our fall athletic program and uh, all the students that were participating in that. Um, I also do want to thank, uh, take this time for, to thank Pat Fowler for all of the uh, hard work that she's done with transportation this, this fall. Um, as I think we all know, we've, we had some, a shortage of drivers and uh, Pat was just outstanding and, and very creative in how she worked uh, our athletic, our away matches and away games. We had 400 athletic events, half of those are probably away and uh, that's with middle school and high school. And we really, or Pat did just a terrific job of <coughs> calling other schools, working with other schools, dropping our team off, other teams picking us up. Um, it was, it's a lot of work and uh, it's one of those behind the scene um, jobs that sometimes uh, we really do need to recognize and acknowledge. So uh, big thank you to Pat and all the work she's done in community services. Um, then I would also like to uh, just echo um, Alan's comment on our volunteers and I think volunteer piece is just uh, is critical in our, our athletic program. Our boosters support about a third of our athletic budget and uh, that's countless hours of volunteering, um, fundraising, and um, just that the financial support is, is just a, it's truly amazing and it's a, it's a huge asset to our athletic programs and I think a, and to the success that our athletic programs have is really attributed to um, that can-do attitude that our, that our parents take. So. Um, and then also would like to uh, just recognize our students. I think we've really seen a shift in some of the school spirit and uh, the support at a lot of our athletic events. And I think just most recently at the Mountain Valley football game, it was really exciting and, and really nice to see a student section standing the entire game, cheering um, appropriately and uh, having a great time with it. So. Uh, it was really neat, and I think you know I, we can really attribute that to the to the senior leadership in general. I think they've done a real good job taking the lead and um, really kind of setting the tone for the school. So um, I think hopefully our our underclassmen will follow your lead, and we can continue forward that and, and try to improve. So um, really nice to see our students um, at all of our events. And um, my last piece was. In the process of doing a report for the school board just on our fall numbers, so I just looked at it quickly and, and taking some notes, it was interesting to see that um, at the high school level, um, our athletic participation number this fall was 266 students participating um, in, at the high school level. Last year we had 267 and um, I think we have about 10 less students in the high school, so that was, that was promising, especially in light of the economic times. Um, in the middle school, we had 185 students participating, and um, that was about 67%. So, um, glad to see that we're um, able to keep these programs going and, and to see that kind of participation, because I think we all realize the importance of um, those extracurricular activities and the value um, of those programs. And I will note, taking it one step further, the I think another strength um, to our program is, is our freshman participation and looked at that as well for the fall and noticed that uh, we had 36 students, freshmen participating on um, freshman teams last year, this year, uh, this fall, we had 35. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I, I, I'm, that, that's very promising um, and uh, you know, we are looking at uh, how these economic times are, are impacting our athletic programs, uh, especially with programs like our first team developmental programs in the middle school. Um, and uh, so we've we're met a few times. We're, we're trying to put a small group together to really kind of um, address the needs of these programs, ways of supporting them, and ways of being creative. Um, it's a lot of work, uh, but I think um, without a question, you know, I think for our students it's, it's critical that 
we have these programs in place and it's, a, it's an important piece um, to that whole school experience. So um, we are addressing that and uh, trying to find some ways to make this work for everyone. Any questions or comments for Jeff? I just want to thank you for taking a proactive approach to that, to the problems or challenges that we may face as a result of the, of the economic the economy because I, I think to reiterate what you said we all know the value of athletics from a health and wellness standpoint um, but I would say that I think our athletic programs are an extension of our classrooms kids learn as much in participation in those um, particularly some more than others then so it sort of adds so thank you for sticking with it in spite of some of the challenges we may be encountering I think those, those participation numbers definitely are a reflection of how important um, those programs are to our students, so um, really neat to see, and it's very, very unique to see that kind of participation at, at the level that we have, as opposed to some of the neighboring communities. So, thank you. Um, okay, finances, Alan. <laughs> no meeting would be complete without. No, that's right. No meeting. Uh, I really am going to not spend a lot of time on this because we'll talk about it in a few minutes the meeting you're going to have on November 23rd. But I would say to uh, both the board and the public that we did receive an update from the uh, commissioner today. I did send it to you, but it was really late uh, this afternoon before I got it. But basically, what the commissioner has told us is somewhat repeated of what we've heard in the past, that there are budget reductions of $38.1 million the current fiscal year and $36 million for fiscal year 2011. What she did say, which I had not heard before, was that Governor Baldacci is reviewing the report that she and other commissioners have presented to him, and he will be making a proposal to the legislature for budget adjustments to reflect the decreased revenues. Uh, she said that they anticipate that this supplemental budget proposal will be made to the legislature sometime in December. Uh, she went on to write, it is important to remember that for now, these are only targets. There are many steps to be taken before there is a final number. The governor will have to make a final recommendation in his proposed supplemental budget, which will go to the Appropriations Committee and then on to the full House and Senate for approval. What she was saying to us is what I think I have told you a, a couple of weeks ago. They're looking at uh, the charts from last year and how much money uh, we were reduced by, and they sent these charts out again. Uh, we were reduced by $421,572 uh, last year. They're estimating that we will probably have, uh, multiply that by 1.4%, and that our loss will probably be in the area of $590,200. Uh, there is also some question of whether the Appropriations Committee will add more to that based on what is happening at the state level. However, the part that I think is the most difficult uh, to work with is to begin to look at reductions for fiscal year 2011. Because what she is saying now, they already approved GPA amount in the biennial budget combined with this new target would result in a statewide subsidy of $910 million, which is $92 million less than the original fiscal year 10 appropriation of of $1.002 trillion, a billion dollars, excuse me. So we already know we're, we're coming out at $92 million less than what we had the year before. And so uh, she's made very clear to us in this letter, we continue to work with you on developing financial strategies and proposals for actions that can be taken by the legislature, the main department of education, and by local school systems. Uh, my understanding is, as a board, uh, you will be meeting on uh, November 23rd, and I don't remember the times. Uh, 7.30 in the morning. 7.30 in the morning, and that's going to be at Jordan, Jordan Conference, Conference Center, room. where we will talk about uh, fiscal year 10 and what uh, possibilities we'll take a look at at that time. And I will be bringing information to the board about what we have for unexpended balances, uh, what some of the debt is that we will be encountering this year, both legal debt as well as uh, other debt will come before us at that point in time. And then uh, our next step will be to take a look at fiscal year 2011 and decide how we will move forward uh, in that piece. Uh, I certainly have moved forward to some extent in my office 
but I have not started building that budget yet, so we will begin to talk about that as well. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Alan. <laughs> Thank you. That's my last bad report tonight. So. <clears throat> Um, moving on to new business, consideration of the following job descriptions. Linda? Yes, the Human Resources Committee looked at some revisions to existing job descriptions that we have. Um, part of the revisions have to do with the fact that Ernie is now just part-time for the school department, so we do have... Ernie's really part-time for the town. For the town. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do have some revisions to the head building custodian and also the custodian's position. Um, all of the revisions are in red just for the ease of the business meeting, but uh, the final copies will, will be reflected in black. Is there a motion to... I was going to say I'd like to move that... Um, we approve the revisions to the job descriptions for the head building custodian and custodian as submitted. Second. Thank you, Linda and Peter. Any questions or comments? Can you just clarify for me who's sure. the custodial administrator? Is that the halftime position for the town? That's actually Janet. Uh, the, the custodian, are you reading the actual home uh, head building custodian? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're reading? I'm repeating. Uh, you're repeating. Okay. <laughs> no, who will report to? Who will report to? Oh, who yeah. report to? The head building custodian under custodian would be, they would report to the head building custodian who is on that second job description. And then the head building custodian would report to the custodial administrator who is Janet. Is there some reference to the community services director that that position is the custodial administrator? I, no, I'm not sure of that, I'll be very honest with you. I think it, it shows in her job description. But job. I, I know it's back. part of the job description I, for I the... Go back just to be absolutely right. sure. You just, you just might want to make sure mm -hmm. that those two linkages are there. Okay. Any other questions or comments for Linda? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you, Linda, and the Human Resources Committee. Okay, policies. Rebecca. Okay, we have policy JRA, student education records and information for a second reading and approval. Um, along with that are um, this administrative procedures, um, J-R-A-R, -R and J-R-A-E, um, and I would like to move that we approve policy J-R-A. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments for Rebecca? I actually have one to myself. <laughs> actually, it's to Alan. Um, and in the thousands of emails, Alan, that you've gotten, um, I had asked if um, on page four of JRA-R, uh, it says, let's see, section F, subsection two, last sentence, it's the, Parents eligible students who do not want the school department to disclose this information must notify the superintendent in writing by September 15th, and it says, or other date designated by the school unit. That, that little um, paragraph will be deleted when the, once the policy is approved. And I just wanted to make sure that that was a date that was uh, uh, effective for you. And I have to look at you, Jeff, because I've not ever received any letter one way or the other. This is military recruiter inst institutions of higher education. Let me say the sentence. Yeah, you, you weren't listening. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Parents eligible students who do not want the school department to disclose basically the student information must notify the superintendent in writing by September 15th. 
or within 30 days of enrollment. But I think that what's critical here for you is, is, is September 15th workable? Yeah, you know, that's very workable, yeah. I mean, we send it out normally with the yes. summer packets, and that's, yeah, that's no problem at all. Sorry. Okay. Um, just okay. so we're clear, we, uh, the board does not approve the administrative procedures. We just read it and make any sort of suggested changes. So I just want to make sure we clean that up. Any other questions or comments by or for Rebecca? <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor. Thank you, Rebecca, and the policy committee, and I know you have more. One more, right? Oh, right. I'm sorry. There's also policy AIHBAC, and this is child find. Um, I'd like to move that we approve this policy. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments on this um, policy? Seeing none, all those in favor? <clears throat> Thank you, Rebecca. And you're on again. All right. We have one policy for uh, first reading. This is uh, policy JICH. It's the substance abuse policy. Um, we had made some changes to this policy last spring that involved um, communication to parents about this particular policy at the high school and um, encountered perhaps some glitches here and there. So Jeff um, kindly provided us with um, the new wording. Basically what this does is say that um, for the athletic, for athletic activities, there will be a mandatory preseason meeting for parents and students before the beginning of each season, um, and it removes the requirement for parent-student meetings for extra, uh, other non-athletic extracurricular activities, um, just requiring a form to be signed by both the student and parent. Um, that's also all, that's with the understanding that the extracurricular. Um, coaches or staff will be communicating the policy information to the enrolled students. So this is just um, uh, up for first reading. We're not going to be taking any vote on it, um, but I do encourage those who have been interested in this policy in the past to um, let us know if they have any questions. They can contact Andrea at the head office if they would like to have the specific wording, or you can email me. Uh, and I can provide you with that information. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions or comments on the first reading? Rebecca can take back to the policy committee. Thank you for um, responding quickly to mm -hmm. concerns around that policy, so it's appreciated. Um, Alan, consideration of middle school co-curricular fee positions. Yes, I have two. Uh, you will note on the back of it that Jeff has written a letter to go along with this, explaining that in the first instance, which is Allison Caruso for math, team grade five and six, uh, this is a position that was in place. He did not have anyone, and she has taken that position, and would like to take that position, I should say. Uh, and the second one is Elizabeth Johnston, who was debating, and she was already doing speech, could not find anyone to do the debate portion of this, so she has agreed to try to do those. So these are new people in the positions, uh, but they are not new positions. They are positions that were there in the beginning. The question was that Steve raised is, do these fall within the freeze? And I think I said last time, and I will continue to do that, uh, unless I get other directions, I am continuing to do these uh, at this point in time because they have played an integral part in some of the educational programs we do with our kids around math team, debate, and speech. Uh, so at this point in time, I have uh, approved bringing them to you for consideration. Is there a motion to approve these positions? I move that we approve these positions. Yes. Thank you, Mary. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions or comments? I actually have one co question. Um, and we're seeing this at the high school. Um, we are funding these positions, but costs associated with them, like transportation, have been frozen. So I think it's fair to let 
parents know and students that potentially if their child is participating in them that there might be a cost that has then been shifted to the families for participation in these programs. Is that a fair? That has already happened at high school and it's also happening at uh, middle school. Any other questions or comments? So yeah. let me just understand that we then um, have a fee to take ride the bus or are we ask the parents to then do the transportation or is there a little bow what will happen at this point in time I do not have I have frozen all money for participation and so I'm not paying for busing mm -hmm. nor am I paying for programs so that the kids who are in the program uh, will be seeking uh, funding from their parents in order to do that you raise a very good point though in terms of policy right because I was thinking we have a policy right. that's pretty strict we went I remember a couple of years ago we went over and over and over with transportation and parents could have transport and, and so forth. So it's, it's just sort of all starting to gel. I think we relaxed it a little bit, but I could be wrong, and I would say that it's probably a good thing for the policy committee to recheck in terms of transportation. I know at this point that some some of the groups are requesting. Um, soliciting, I'm not sure what the right term is, donations from the, their families if their child is participating. I know that the parents associations are getting um, inundated, might be the right word, with requests for funding for some of these. And they're, they're, they're um, you know, really important programs. For example, the math and the science team, we had that great presentation last year at the high school. Mm -hmm. And they're stuck. I mean, they're stuck. They're, there's a, 50 kids participating on the math team, for example, at the high school, and they're, they have, I think, $900 in transportation, and they have no way to pay for it. So they, one of the plans is perhaps to charge kids $3 to ride the bus each time, like a nominal fee, but it, it is shifting the cost. I don't know, based on your report on finances, that we really have another choice, um, but I think the public and parents in the community needs to know that that's what's happening. But I do think your point is well taken that we need to check our policy. Yeah, because I'm just trying to figure out, are we charging right. $3 so they can take the bus, or are we saying, parents, you know, this is where it's going to be happening, and you need to get your child there? Mm -hmm. Right now we're right. saying, to, to, we're still under the, under assuming that we're going to be providing bus transportation. And I think before we switch gears, we need to consult our policy to make sure that and that might be something we might we might need to review if finances get significantly worse. We might need to revisit that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none. All those in favor of these two positions. Okay. Thank you. Um, committee reports. Is there anyone who wishes to give a report on their committee? I think just really quickly on behalf, Karen is our CIF um, liaison, I think she will expand more in December, but I think just a general um, note that CIF did award the grants, I think, last week? Last week, yes. Um, somewhere in the vicinity of $20,000, $30,000. Um, so obviously a thank you on behalf of the, the school department. And um, also, in our, you weren't there, Kathy, at our last finance committee meeting, but I think the board was all rather pleased that we'd like to share that we had but positive financial results in our food services um, department, and we would like to thank and recognize um, Peter Esposito, the new food services manager, and the people that are working in his department to sort of help that happen. So thank you. Um, anybody else? Committee? Okay. Um, no other public comment on agenda items? Okay. School board agenda requests. Any requests for upcoming agenda items? Okay. Um, upcoming meetings, they are um, on the website of the various committee meetings. Again, just um, our, another emphasis on our workshop next Tuesday, November 10th, on English language arts. Um, but please check the website, and minutes are there as well from all the various committee meetings. And um, at this point, anyone interested in making a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Peter. Second. Second. Thank you, Linda. All those in favor? Thank you very much, and good evening. Mm -hmm.